Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Thursday and happy fall 2021. Uh, welcome to the ACES and Community Resilience Community of Practice kickoff meeting. Uh, today, we're very happy to have a special guest, Caroline Folkman from the Guelph Waterloo ACES Coalition. And I'll be turning you over to Wendy shortly, who will uh, introduce Caroline properly. But before we do that, uh, a quick um, moment to acknowledge together that our presence on Indigenous territory. The work of the Alliance and our members and partners takes place on traditional territories of Indigenous nations who've lived here and cared for these lands since time immemorial. The land that we call Ontario is covered by 46 treaties, agreements and land purchases, as well as unceded territories. Canada continues to be home to many Indigenous people who live here alongside settlers, newcomers and people whose ancestors were enslaved across the Americas and the Caribbean. Recognizing this in a meaningful way means making commitments to sharing and upholding our responsibilities to all who now live on these lands uh, and considering the impacts of our presence, our words and our actions on the Indigenous people who were here first. And with that, I will turn you over to Wendy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine, and thank you for the land acknowledgement. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Wendy Veik. I'm the Director of Community Health at Kingston Community Health Centers. And uh, I am very grateful for the opportunity to be part of um, a community of practice around ACEs and positive um, protective factors and resilience. And, um, and it's been really fun for me to be part of um, this sort of team that's bubbled up in a very sort of organic way. And um, we're very um, excited about the opportunity of, of creating the space for us to have this conversation. Um, so part of this team, um, certainly Catherine McDonald from the Alliance. Catherine is the Knowledge Translation Specialist uh, with the Alliance and has been incredibly helpful to us in um, uh, keeping us on track and, and creating the meeting um, context and spaces. And uh, so thanks for that, Catherine. It's been really fun working with you. Um, Kate Vistula is uh, the Director of um, Organizational Community Development uh, with the Guelph CHC, and Kate's not here today, but uh, certainly a key member of this team, and we've had some really great conversations, so um, we're thrilled to have Kate's support. Uh, Sarah is with us today. So, hi, Sarah. Sarah Hanstra, and Sarah is um, the man manager at uh, Toward Common Ground. And, uh, and I'm very happy to introduce you to Caroline Feldman. And Caroline is with the Asians Coalition of Guelph and is the Building Community Resilience Project Manager. So Caroline's very graciously agreed to provide the, um, the presentation for today. And what that will look like is um, Caroline will do the presentation and there's opportunity for discussion and questions um, at the end of that. And then um, as part of Caroline's presentation, but then there'll also be an opportunity for us to maybe come together and talk about how we can support one another in creating a community of practice. And on the topic of a community of practice, um, so often I, I hear the language around a community of practice being on, you know, coming together to solve a problem, a common set of problems and that sort of thing. And which in, in my mind has a little bit of a negative connotation to it. And where I'm really happy about creating a community of practice is really around um, the true spirit of collaboration and coming together to share ideas and resources in a very positive and solution focused way. And, uh, and I think this work, I know for us at, at KCHC, um, we're looking at creating a community of practice with our in our own community, and it was it's been wonderful to connect with the Guelph team and the Aces Coalition and toward Common Ground because so much work was happening in parallel. And when we realized that we could come together, and there's certainly efficiency around that because we're all pressed for time these days. But having that common understanding and and um, being able to to come together to to um, explore opportunities and solutions together has been um, a wonderful and that it's been reassuring and it's just that wonderful feeling of knowing we're not in this alone. So, so thanks to everybody on the team uh, for all of that support and the work and we're looking forward to meeting some new folks and moving forward um, to, to mobilize this work. So on that note, I'll turn it over to Caroline and, um, and thanks everyone for being here today. Thanks, it's a, a pleasure to be here. And um, Wendy, I love that you talked about the solutions focused and collaboration opportunities because that really is what um, positive childhood experiences 
is about. It's taking our focus that has been on ad adversity for the last 30 years and kind of flipping it to really think about um, the way that positive childhood experiences can prevent and protect mental and long-term physical and emotional health. So if Catherine or Wendy you could give me a thumbs up just to make sure that you can sleep, see the slide deck. Okay, great, then I will go ahead. Um, and thank you everyone for joining this call. So my hope today is that you will learn something about the growing evidence that supports the promotion of positive childhood experiences and building resilience and reducing and preventing the effects of adverse childhood experiences. And I am going to, I, I'm relying really on two key pieces of work. And the first, I'm gonna just summarize an article called The Positive Childhood Experiences and Adult Mental Health and Relational Health in a Statewide Sample, Associations of Across ACE Levels. And this is really, I, my understanding is it's a seminal study getting us to think about those positive childhood experiences and more of a, um, a solutions focused approach. And then to share with you, um, the HOPE framework, healthy outcomes from positive experiences. And it's just, again, one way of thinking about positive childhood experiences and promoting protective factors. And then we can have um, some time for discussion. It's a pretty small group. Um, so we can think about maybe how this would shift our practice or your practice. Um, now, one thing I was gonna also do, um, I don't see it in the chat. Oh, there we go. I'm just gonna, for you, um, I am just put in the chat the links to these key resources if there are things that you wanna follow up with when we're done. So I'm gonna start by talking to you about the, um, the, the study I mentioned with the quite a lo long title. And really in a nutshell, the authors wanted to understand how positive, child, positive experiences in early life affect adult mental health and how do positive experiences interact with adverse childhood experiences to affect adult health. And as I said, I, you've got the link to the article in the chat. So just some background to this study is that we know from neuroscience research that both positive and adverse experiences influence brain development and health across the lifespan. Um, children with adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are at risk for changes in the brain anatomy, gene expression and delays in, in development. And we also know that um, the, this can have long-term implications for health and well-being, including increased risk of many diseases and increased risk of early death. Um, prior studies have identified resiliency factors and adaptive skills and intervention and interventions. And in the article, they highlight some of the work by the Search Institute. Um, the Search Institute developed a list of 40 developmental assets that and, and they developed de in their study, they demonstrated an association between the number of assets and both positive and negative outcomes. And other studies have looked at the positive family experience in childhood in relation to adolescent pregnancy. So those with more positive experiences were less likely to experience a pregnancy in adolescence. And the other um, important background to this study is that there is no standard, there, has not been prior to this a standardized measure examining the prevalence of positive childhood experiences at the population level for adults or children. So that's something else that they are hoping to establish. So this study was done part as part of the with Wisconsin Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. And the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey is, a is actually a national survey in the United States, similar to um, the Canadian, now it's escaping me, but a population um, level assessment of overall population health across the country. And they, um, you're able to add specific questions. And so this state, this was done on the state level in Wisconsin in 2015. Um, and the survey was English speaking or Spanish speaking individuals were eligible to participate. They had a response rate of about 45%. 
And they had a sample of 6,188 individuals of whom 85% were white. Um, this is pretty consistent with the overall population. And they had about 50% male and 50% female participation. So to address their research questions, they established five different key measures. And I'll go into each of these, including the positive childhood experiences score, the adverse childhood experiences score. Um, they asked people to report their social and emotional levels of social and emotional support. They asked um, for information about depression or poor mental health. And they asked some other um, information about some other variables. So they measured positive childhood experiences on a seven item scale. And those positive experiences that score um, or the, the tool was adapted from other research tools, including the child and youth resilience measure. And you'll hear me talk about Michael Ungar a little bit later. He's a social work researcher at Dalhousie University and or he's, he's doing some really important work. And so his work on resilience guided the development of this measure. And so they assessed as adults, whether as a child, the individuals felt able to talk to their family about their feelings, whether they felt their family stood by them during difficult times, whether they enjoyed participating in community traditions, whether they felt a sense of belonging in high school, whether they felt supported by friends, had at least two non-parent adults who took genuine interest in them and felt safe and protected by an adult in their home. And these um, measures were added up just to create a sum score of from zero to seven. They used um, the CDC Centers for Disease Control and Prevention standardized ACEs survey, which um, the items were coded using cumulative scores grouping up to only eight, which we often hear about 10 ACEs, but this particular measure um, scores to eight. And they assessed physical abuse as a child, emotional abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, household dysfunction, substance abuse, parental incarceration, or divorce. To assess adult reported social and emotional support, they asked participants how often they get the social and emotional support they need and measured this on a five point Likert scale. And to address, to assess depression or poor mental health, they asked a question about whether or not anyone had been diagnosed with depression and also a score of 14 or higher on the single item validated um, measure as an indicator of current or poor mental health. And they, adults were um, considered to have poor mental health or depression by if they reported either or both of the outcomes assessed. They gathered basic demographic data, including age, race or ethnicity and annual income. And here's where the, the findings and this is where things get, I think, pretty interesting. Um, about half of the participants, the 6,000 participants, reported six to seven, eight positive childhood experiences. So again, the maximum that they could measure, the maximum score was seven. 57% um, reported adverse childhood experiences. Again, this is similar to national level data where it's about two thirds of participants typically report at least one adverse childhood experience. 21% um, met the criteria for depression or poor mental health. And about half, just slightly over half, reported always to getting the social and emotional support they needed. Um, interestingly, and they didn't um, delve into the, this finding, but again, it's probably not surprising um, given inequality that non-white, younger and lower income adults reported fewer level of positive childhood experiences. The good news in this study is that they found that positive childhood experiences or PCEs as they measured them protect adult mental health. Um, positive childhood experiences buffer against the negative lifelong health effects caused by exposure to ACEs. So the study found a, that P, PCEs show a dose response relationship between adult mental and relational health. And for in this slide, you're seeing that for those who had exposure to at least one ACE, um, depression, poor mental health um, scores that were 20, 
people were 72, the scores were 72% lower for adults with higher PCE scores. And adults reporting fewer zero to two PCEs had a four times higher prevalence of depression and poor mental health than those reporting six to seven PCEs. So we're seeing that protective nature of PCEs. And they think that pro promoting PCEs may reduce adult mental health problems. They also found that PCEs protect, can protect relational health. Um, so when they ask participants how often they get the emotional support they need, um, those with the, the scores were greatest for people who had more PCEs. So the odds of always reporting um, support were three and a half times greater for adults with the highest versus six or seven PCEs versus adults with the lowest zero to two PCEs. Like any study, it's important to consider the limitations. So this was a cross-sectional study. It was a, assessed at one point in time. Um, and I haven't seen any, the study was published in 2019. I'm not sure if they replicated it. Um, as I mentioned, there's lack of diversity in the sample. And this is, I think, partly attributed to the population of Wisconsin. Um, PCEs focused on the domain of positive emotional experiences in interpersonal relationships. So there could be some other key elements missing. And the data didn't assess overall well being or flourishing. Um, and they were unable to assess that impact on physical health outcomes. Nonetheless, it's pretty promising information in that PCEs demonstrated a dose response association with adult um, depression and poor mental health and social and emotional support after adjusting for adverse childhood experiences. And PCEs both co occur with and operate independently from ACEs. And PCEs can mitigate these effect, the effects of ACEs and buffer toxic stress. And in future, we really should think about assessing both adverse childhood experiences and positive childhood experiences at the same time. Um, I also forgot to mention a thank you. We had, we were fortunate enough to have a master's student work with us this summer. And it was Erin Neer who um, really led the development of these, these slides. So she's not here, but a big thank you to Erin. Um, so I'm gonna move into now the concept of transforming practice with hope or the hope framework. Um, and the hope framework follows on um, this, really encouraging research that positive childhood experiences can promote long-term mental and emotional health. Um, and let me just look at my notes to make sure that I'm not missing any key information. Um, so I'm gonna share the highlights of the HOPE framework or the acronym is Healthy Outcomes from Positive Experiences. And their intention is really to transition these research findings into practice to improve individual and public health. Um, in the article, the authors argue that hope represents a paradigm shift in how we see and talk about the positive experiences that support children's growth and development. Um, they argue that hope adds a balancing lens from the focus of adversity and ACEs to one that considers um, ACEs and the effects of other systematic issues like racism and the individual and organizational structures that have arisen to address their effects. Sorry, I flipped too soon. Um, I pulled a lot of what I'm sharing with you from um, what's called the HOPE course. So if you are really interested in this, and I'll put the, the link in the chat when I'm finished, um, they have, a, I think it was about three to five hour course that kind of delves a little bit more deeply into how they develop the framework and that key elements of the framework. Um, so as you see in the graph here, the first um, consideration in their framework is spirit. And um, the framework is based on the science of the positive. So the science of the positive highlights that positive exists in ourselves and in our communities. And this consideration of spirit acknowledges the importance of empathy, respect, collaboration, rather than, as they say, othering those that we serve. So it's got a real like intentionality around equity. Um, the framework also considers 
in the, in the blue box here, the old science. Um, and the old science is um, for those who've studied it or those who don't know about it, I'll talk a little bit, a bit now about the term adverse childhood experience. So the old science is that we now know that um, early adversity affects brain development and health. And it comes, this understanding comes from the 1998 Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And in this study, they defined ACEs or Adverse Childhood Experiences as stressful or potentially traumatic abuse, neglect or household challenges. And as I've alluded to, they can increase the risk of negative health behaviors and outcomes later in life. Um, from the last 25 years of study, we know that ACEs are common and universal. Um, even within Wellington, Duffer and Guelph, our, early child, our childhood experiences survey, we found that 81% of respondents had at least one adverse childhood experience and 31% of people reported four or more. This is similar, um, but even a little bit higher than um, is reported nationally. Um, so the three types of ACEs that were initially defined include abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual. They include neglect, physical, and emotional, and they include household challenges, um, mental illness, untreated, intimate partner violence, um, parental separation, substance misuse, and living, having a relative who's incarcerated. So the framework considers that old science is really informative and important, but it adds to it new science. And this new science, again, relates to what I just shared with you and really highlights that ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, do not tell the whole story. Um, so I snuck in another slide here. Um, the Community Resilience Initiative in Walla Walla, Washington, uh, I just finished some training, maybe some people on this call have also done that training. Um, some of their new science is thinking about early adversity, not only in terms of those 10 um, issues studied in the 1998 study, but also considering um, adverse community experiences. So these are social conditions that can lead to individual problems, including um, thing, uh, community experience, including things like um, systemic poverty. Let me see that I've got the right thing. Um, so they, they've highlighted an additional four categories of ACEs that CRI has, including the adverse community environments. So risk factors, including um, things like poverty. So that's the community environments, um, violence in a community. They've included adverse cultural exposures. So risk factors um, from mistreatment based on culture, such as racism. Um, adverse circuitry expression, and this includes risk factors for mi mistreatment based on brain um, diversity, such as being on the autism spectrum, um, and adverse catas catastrophic events, so risks from catastrophic events or natural disasters, such as massive fire, forest fires, earthquakes, and hurricanes. And so we know from the science as well that these ACEs can um, create that toxic stress response that acts similarly to the 10 original categories of ACEs. The new science um, also acknowledges that we have a better understanding of the biological mechanisms associated with positive child experiences. And the positive child, positive experience can promote both biological and physiological changes to the brain and healing from toxic stress. And just some, some background evidence for this, we know that our brains can change over time, they're plastic. Um, we know that they um, change, it's, it's easier to change a brain when a person is young, but we can change into an adulthood. And so the HOPE um, framework group highlights um, stroke recovery as an example, that individuals can regain function in their brains after a stroke. Um, they also highlight the importance of post-traumatic brain growth. Uh, so after one of these catastrophic events, they actually see, depending on person's subjective experience, um, they might have a, a, a renewed um, outlook on life and they see changes in the brain. They observe changes in the brain. 
Um, they also highlighted some um, information or some research around the way that meditation can actually st structurally change your change your brain, including functional changes and sustained resilience. The biological mechanism they think to explain some of these changes is that toxic stress causes high levels of stress hormones, such as cortisol, which get our nervous systems going and um, lead to those changes in um, the brain and in other metabolic and physiological systems. Whereas childhood or positive childhood experiences, they think that um, those PCs, that positivity, that nurturing um, actually increases the love hormones or um, oxytocin as an example. And oxytocin may have a role in brain adaptation. Um, and as cortisol goes up, the oxytocin goes down. And they use the example of a child on a playground that they may get hurt, their, their, their cortisol is going up, but as soon as they see their parent or that nurturing relationship, the oxytocin kicks in and they, their stress response is not as severe or sustained and the cortisol goes away. So oxytocin turns down that stress response and decreases the duration and frequency of negative hormonal and, and potentially epigenetic changes. And it starts the repair mechanisms um, required for healthy brain development, such as cell division in the brain. Um, it enables the brain to make new connections, those helping those nerve fibers in our brain grow and reestablishing healthy brain architecture. So that's the new science and how they argue um, for this framework. The next element here is the action step. And this is where they've um, created a metaphor to identify the four building blocks of hope or of resilience. And we really can think about um, these four building blocks of the building blocks as key protective factors to promote resilience in children. Um, and they're based on um, common elements taken from multiple research perspectives. So some of you who are maybe familiar with Michael Ungar's work, you can slot each of these building blocks um, into things that he talks about, especially in terms of relationships. I think um, Wendy also talked about, you know, that shift to positive experiences or the solution focused. And you'll see if you haven't already, the American Academy of Pediatrics has also started promoting this and really they, their emphasize, emphasis in a new policy statement is around the first building block of relationships. So the most, the pr one protective factor would be that children have relationships within the family and other children and adults through interpersonal activities. And so the, this aligns really closely with, with what the Harvard Center for Developing Child talks about in terms of supporting responsive relationships. And the American Academy of Pediatrics, their um, new statement is called Preventing Childhood Toxic Stress, Partnering with Families and Communities to Promote Relational Health. And here they're really acknowledging that we've had a problem focused um, on addressing ACEs and toxic stress and really focusing on the relationship brings a more solution focused, um, more hopeful lens. Um, the other building block is safe, equitable, and stable environments for living, playing, learning at home and in school. The third is social and civic engagement to develop a sense of belonging and connectedness and emotional growth through playing and interacting with peers for self-awareness and regulation. And the last element of this framework is the return or the reflection, or as I kind of think about it, the action and the implementation. Really the intent is that you help, we help all children have positive, experience, positive experiences. And so some things to think about as you're maybe wanting to implement such a framework is you can ask the question, like, how can I, as a physician, as a home visitor, as a teacher, as a whoever I am, promote access to these um, four building blocks, whether it be the supportive relationship, the safe environment, or the it's opportunities for emotional growth. Um, the other highlights of the framework are is, is that they're 
associated and they can build on language or they can they use language that can serve as a bridge between health and workers, family support workers and social service sectors. So again, it's that how can I help add to what the family is already experiencing to build those opportunities for positive experiences. Um, similarly, hope can be, the framework can be integrated, integrated into existing efforts. Um, home visitor programs, again, are an example they use, but how can I as a home visitor um, explain more about the importance of relationships, facilitate relationships for my, the, the children and families that I'm supporting. Um, and the other thing that the kind of the research or, or the HOPE authors have considered is that um, providers want practical tools to assist them with incorporating HOPE into their work. And they've added references and resources to their website, which aligns with the, the feedback that we hear in our work that people want practical tools. So again, even that question, how can I, um, or how can the system around me, or how can I support this family in um, creating opportunities within the system, it just gives a little bit more of a practical, hopeful nature, other, rather than how can I eliminate um, an adverse childhood experience? Again, it's a little bit trickier. Um, this has more of an appreciative, hopeful lens. So I, uh, if, if people are interested, we're ha I'm happy to have the discussion. Um, the, I mentioned earlier that the authors describe the HOPE framework as a paradigm shift. So based on where you are in your work, like, do you, do you think, is it a paradigm shift? And how can you promote more access to one of the four building blocks with um, parents or community members, youth or children in your community? So I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to um, talk about those discussion questions, um, but I really welcome a conversation. And I'll put the questions in the chat. Any questions at all for Caroline? I'll just make a comment. <laughs> oh, great. Um, yeah, I, I just, um, I really find the shift toward um, kind of the PCEs and thinking about that just a very hopeful way of engaging with this work because it feels like there are some very clear ways and places where we can do things differently um, and also just understanding how protective those PCEs are is, is super helpful again in terms of just knowing that, that there are things that we as community partners, service providers, people that live in communities can do that are, are really going to be protective for individuals and communities as a whole. So I'm, I'm loving the shift and thanks Caroline for sharing uh, that with us. I'm enjoying that shift too and I'm reminded um, uh, of a study, I think it was out of Queens actually, um, that looked at and, and just the um, just the, the acronym for HOPE and that paradigm shift is so important, but there was a study out of Queens that looked at um, um, a young person's level of hope was um, considered to be the number one indicator of their sort of career trajectory. And it was just, you, you know, despite, uh, then this, this goes back a few years and was related to our Pathways to Education program in Kingston. But when we looked at um, youth who had so many adverse childhood experiences, but that, that hope indicator, and I think just the positive connotations around it, for me, it was, I felt this collective sigh of relief among all of our staff when we were learning about that, just that, okay, there's reason for optimism and there's a focus that, um, because I, I go back to the days when people were saying, okay, let's, let's measure everybody's ACEs. And it was just such a negative way to start a conversation. And so I think that, that paradigm shift is, um, is great for all of us. And, uh, and I think, create, like when I think about a community or practice and creating that new knowledge, but then we're also creating new strategies and new ways to collaborate and a new subject matter with which we can kind of mobilize all of that. So thank you so much, Caroline. That was very, very informative and very inspiring. And I can't wait to take it back to the rest of our team. Um, I'd be curious to hear from some of our participants about where things are in your respective communities around this type of work. Is this new information for you? Is it something that you feel you're ready to start to collaborate with others or willing to share? 
I think Malika, if I'm saying your name correctly, I think I see a hand raised there. Go ahead. Yes, um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I, I wanted to say that I thought this um, webinar was really refreshing. I don't personally work directly with youth. Uh, but I am a community development agent and we have a new community house. And so when we are thinking about, you know, um, building strategies and new programming, I think we do have a big focus on, on all the negative and, and trying to, yes, create positive experiences, but not necessarily building on uh, the positive, you know, experiences that are that are happening and using that lens uh, when we are at a time where we're creating new programming uh, was uh, was just fantastic for me to think, okay, you know, why don't I start looking at this the other way around? We, we talk about how youth in our community, um, we have a community that is, is basically all social high housing, high levels of violence, not Good access to buses, to groceries, a food dessert, uh, a, a food desert, not dessert, desert. Sorry, I'm French. And, and just to kind of look at it the other way, I find is, is going to be, even when we are asking youth about what, what they are looking for, but, but taking that positive experience perspective rather than, you know, unintentionally maybe digging for trauma. And, and negative experience and just making that consultation process heavy um, is, is, is uh, very hopeful uh, for me. And I, I'm so thankful that I attended this today. I really feel like this will absolutely make a shift on the lens that we will be using and it comes as a perfect time for us. I will share this with our community house coordinator as well um, because we are often focused on, on you know, building resiliency um, because of, of negative you know, experiences and traumatic experiences and, and, and we don't really bring that out of youth a lot. Like, you know, what has been good for you? So. Yeah, a breath of fresh air for me today. Thank you very much. It's Renee. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. I have some equipment malfunction, so I can't turn my camera on, but <laughs> I'm glad you can hear me. Um, I, I basically echo everything Malika just said, too, about um, just, just that shift of thinking. Absolutely. Um, we're focused on the negative experience of families and children and, and youth. Um, so that was really, really great to, to read. And I'm definitely going to follow up on some of the links. Um, so I'll just echo what she said. But I also, I felt feeling hopeful <laughs> for our own programs. You know, there's some things we're kind of struggling to start as in engaging youth in our community, as well as, um, you know, trying to get uh some sort of in-person connections and relationships happening again. And, um, but I think it's just really reinforced for me that it is really important. Just keep going. We need to keep trying. We need to do what we can do. We have a bit of a youth advisory committee just kind of in the budding stages. We haven't had a lot of uptake, um, which seems to be the story. We've tried it in different communities uh, in, a, in our area. And it, um, it's just, you know, three or four people respond and then it never gets rolling. I'd love to hear if anybody has an experience because I think, you know, when it said the social and civic engagement is one of the four building blocks to promote resilience. And so I, you know, what we're trying to do where that youth advisory committee falls right into that building block and I would love it to be successful. Um, so any experiences you have on that or tips to share or just, you know, keep going because I feel like, um, um, I guess maybe families and people are in a habit or not in the habit of jumping onto activities anymore or programs that are being offered. Does anyone have any feedback to share? 
I, I did raise my hand and, and maybe this is just something that's transferable to youth. Um, in, in my last position, we had done some youth consultation and I, I worked a lot in community development and, and with committees. And, and what is my new strategy and what I found has worked a lot more uh, in, you know, in communities where people uh, might already be tired, uh, exhausted, dealing with various issues, youth with school and schedule changing, is to get whoever shows up on that one day and think of a small project rather than a long-term committee um, and let them be successful in something that's small. So lots of punctual projects um, that are measurable in the sense that you say to you, okay, this is your idea. And that means that we would work on this for two months. And at the end of the two months, this would be the result. And this is the type of time that you'd need to, um, to be involved in this project. I found it that even in adults, it's, because it's, it's shown so much more successful. The power dynamics are a lot healthier. Um, you know, you don't have the same challenges of welcoming new people and some individuals feeling like they have sweat equity in a committee. So, you know, they have uh, bigger voices and, and that it allows also more people with less resources to be able to augment their sense of belonging in the community by one short little project. I found that it's affected more people than by trying to do something that's ongoing that meets monthly for a year, for six months. So I've really changed my strategy um, when I do community development work to, to just work on projects with one group and then it's with two or three other individuals or five or six individuals as another project. And I find the experiences of everybody involved is a lot more positive and you're uh, able to include um, a, a lot more diverse people. And I mean, when I say diverse, I could be diverse of ideas. So somebody who's interested in a community kitchen, but for a one month and you put your energy there, but then you can uh, go to a, uh, you know, a reading club, but for one month as well, so that you can put your energy and it also I find plant seeds, some of them continue to be ongoing. And some of them are just a really positive experience for someone where, where they they feel like they belong. And that even if they're involved in a short project, they feel like they belong for a really, um, a, for a very long time, right? Like it has that lasting effect even though they might not be involved in the committee for a very long period of time. So um, I, I imagine the strategy can also be useful with youth, uh, but um, I've definitely had a, a lot more success by, by operating by project with small groups of people rather than with ongoing committees. Thank you, Malika, that's um, really helpful. Um, and I know in, uh, in Kingston, what we have um, really tried to do is mobilize the service providers around this work and by, so that there's no wrong door for a participant. I know that's a, we use that term a lot, but um, I find that when a, a family or a participant or a youth or, or a patient client, um, here's a suggestion from one service provider, but then also here's the same message from another that reinforces it and the value of it, I think. And so sometimes we just need to give it time, but creating that, um, that community of practice, I think having the consistent messaging from our service providers really, really does help. So yes. Any other questions or comments? Um, just out of curiosity, I don't, if people don't mind hearing, I'd just love to hear what communities you're from. Um, Darlene, we haven't heard from you yet. Do you mind saying where you're from? Sure, I'm, I'm with the Gateway Community Health in Tweed and Renee is my colleague and she's been here quite a long time. Um, so I'm the newbie. I'm in a community resource worker role. Um, I just shot a message to uh, Malika to say, hey, let's chat sometime because I need to pick the brain. Um, this is really great stuff. Um, it, it almost seems common sense, doesn't it? Why does it take us so long to get to this? 
but it makes me think about, um, you know, 25 years ago, uh, working in violence against women and children. And we always said to women who were so concerned about their kids, your kids will do as well as you're doing. So as long as you're doing well, they'll be doing well. And here we are 25 years later and trying to get that message out um, because it's, it really is the bottom line. As long as parents are doing well, the kids are gonna be doing well. So I'm in a different role. <clears throat> Renee works with the kids and the youth, whereas my role is with the adults after they've had all those aces, as you say. Um, but I love the, uh, just the simple question, how can I promote access to the four building blocks? And, um, you know, what can we add to the family? So this is great stuff. It just brings it down to simple, simple things that we can do. So thank you. Well, thank you for attending both. And uh, you know, Tweed's just down the road from Kingston, really. So <laughs> if you if you want to join in on some of our community practice work in Kingston, I'd be happy to loop you into the emails. That because would be know, great. Yeah, I know. Our, and I, as much as it's I, regions and territories don't matter to me, I'd rather, I'd rather share the knowledge. So um, yeah, so uh, my, yeah, if you want to pop me an email, then that would be great. I'm going to so, put my email in your, in the box okay. here and Thank Perfect. you. Yeah, that would be great. Malika, do you mind sharing where you're from or what community? Oops, absolutely. So I now work on the uh, unceded uh, land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe um, people, uh, also named Ottawa. But Wendy, I do remember your name because I worked in Kingston for a long time, both at the Elizabeth Fry Society and at Kingston Interval House and at the uh, Francophone Immigration Network. So it took me a second to figure out where you were from and how come I knew you, but I got it now. Oh, um, <laughs> so I am a community developer and I have a citywide position. Is That's new for community developers. Usually they're located to their center, but because our health center provides services to such a wide range of individuals and a lot of uh, resource, a lot of centers close to um, our neighborhood, they're just resource center and they don't have the help piece. Um, you know, so uh, I have a city wide uh, position in Ottawa, but my office is located in Sandy Hill. Well, thanks, Malika. I, I thought I knew your name too. So this, I'm, I'm happy that you've solved the mystery for me. Um, and I know we're just coming up on the last couple of minutes here. Um, and uh, Catherine has recorded this for us at um, for the Alliance and it will be on the Alliance YouTube channel. So I encourage you to share with your colleagues if there's anyone that you feel would benefit. Um, and, uh, and I think it's important that we keep this conversation going. So thank you for your, your time and attention today. Uh, Caroline or Sarah, Catherine, anybody have anything to add? I would, I would just add and encourage anyone. We are, are the ACES Coalition of Gulf and Wellington has, has initiated and in, was initiated in 2017. Um, and we are just, this is how we're shifting our work more to the hopeful, more to the positive, considering a name change. Um, but in the interim, I do recommend anyone interested in this content, check out our website because we have a series of training modules that are available at this point free of charge and we're hoping to update soon. Um, the modules talk about, like give a real foundation uh, to the, around the knowledge of understanding what ACEs are, how they affect brain development, the importance of resilience um, and what you can do about it. And there's also a specific module targeted towards early childhood educators or people who work with young children. And we're in the process of developing other, other modules. So it might be a, research, uh, a resource. Thanks Catherine for adding that there. It might be a resource for people. and feel free to share it out with your colleagues and friends. Thanks, Carolina. Um, yeah, Carolina and I are in Guelph and Wellington County together. Um, I'll just add that we also have a toolkit um, and it's meant to guide. So we take in the training. So what, what, what can you do in your organization conversations with staff and colleagues? Um, the other thing I was just gonna ask and, um, and Wendy, I'm not sure if you were gonna get to this piece, but just in, in terms of those that are here, um, 
like a, moving forward with the community of practice, just curious about how often could something like that fit in your schedule? Does this idea of over lunch, um, I ended up turning off my video so you didn't have to watch me eat. <laughs> um, but, you know, does this time work? Um, I know people are busy. So just wondering if you want to weigh in, like, it, could you make, would you want to come to something three times a year? Is an hour the right length of time? Would you prefer that it's at the end of your day? Any, anything that would help us kind of organize this to meet people's needs? And you're here, so you get a say. So whatever. <laughs> if you're like, actually, I'd prefer five in the morning. Well, guess what? We'll take it into consideration. Probably not five, but you're here. So um, yeah, any thoughts, anything about it? Because uh, we want this. I mean, ideally, we can get a few more people interested. And we know that people are so busy right now doing everything that you do during your day. So we want it to be reasonable. Good use of your time and work with your schedule. I must say that I, you know, I was typing this time and Lent was great. Um, and, and yes, five in the morning might only suit somebody like me, but it did make me think of the fact that I think that early morning is probably the time where, you know, we can take in the most information for most, a lot of people. Um, and that there is very rarely trainings that, that, you know, are at nine in the morning and so while i you know i didn't consider it at first i i would personally like that uh something that is before starting my day even at work um it might not be for everyone but you know for me that's something um that would be great for me something in the evening is never a good time to you know to learn um new information you know yeah Thank you. That's all. Thanks, folks, for for sharing. And then there was a note in the comments about this time and length um, was great. And um, that's Malika and Darlene said that this time and length three to four times a year was great. And the other thing that we are working on is a um, a conference coming up that we're hoping to tack on to another event that um, Sarah and her team are working on as well. Um, so do stay um, uh, in touch with the Alliance and watch for communication around that because we really would like to bring a larger group together um, with a bigger chunk of time for us to really take a deeper dive into a lot of this work. So um, I think as much as I know all of our schedules, we're, we're busy these days, I do find there's tremendous merit in getting in the same virtual room at the same time and sharing some of this and, and, and moving things forward. I know, I know for me, this work has just made such a difference in my in, in the work I do with our community members and for our teams as well. So I think the return on investment is certainly worthwhile. And I'm very, very grateful to Sarah and Caroline and many of the others who are, are doing the research and gathering the information and sharing it with us. So, so thank you very, very much. Yeah. Oh, and a French training. That's a fantastic idea. Thank you, Malika. That's yeah. Uh, and and les réseaux de service de santé en français would probably like collaborate and maybe even have resources to make that possible. Um, that's a great idea. Super. They would promote it as well, which you know could get a lot of individuals on. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Any any other questions or comments before we get back to our our, our other work? Okay. Well, thank you again for spending time with us. It's been uh, great to get to to um, to know you all a little bit and. Uh, and do please keep in touch and, um, and watch the Alliance website for future information on a conference. 